it's Katrina. Ain Dara Temple Footprints Located northwest of Aleppo, Syria, Ain Dara is a small village and home to the magnificent Ain Dara Temple. In 1955, a huge basalt lion was found completely by accident, and then later excavations revealed it was part of a large temple. One of the most famous features are enormous footprints on the ground, meant to represent the footsteps of the gods. The Syro-Hittites, also known as the Neo-Hittites, were a political group that emerged toward the end of the second millennium BC, filling a power vacuum in the eastern Mediterranean that was left behind by the collapse of the Hittite Empire. They likely did not see themselves as different from their predecessors, but in hindsight the two groups were distinct. After rising to power, the Syro-Hittites became the dominant force in the region until the 8th century BC when the Neo-Assyrian Empire conquered them. Built during the early Iron Age, the Ain Dara Temple was situated next to a courtyard made from sandstones and flagstones. The temple itself measured 100 feet by 100 feet and was once lined with basalt rocks bearing carvings of sphinxes and other mythical creatures. Now only their feet remain. One of the most interesting features is a set of three-foot-long footprints carved into the temple's stone floor, followed by two single footprints which are spaced roughly 30 feet apart an appropriate distance for a giant or a god who would have stood 65 feet tall. While no one really thinks an actual giant god stepped into the temple, it is an extremely unique feature. The question is, why did the builders make these footprints? Some researchers believe that they are the iconic footprint of the deity that would be found inside, as if to show the presence of the deity as they enter their chamber temple and cross the room. They leave quite the impression, even today. Neptune's Storm Reversal a year after spotting a dark storm on Neptune in 2018, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope captured the vortex abruptly reversing. These storms typically vanish or fade after a few years, but this one behaved much differently, stopping in its tracks while traveling south and making a U-turn, moving back northward. Researchers discovered a smaller dark spot on the planet, which they believe may be a cousin storm that branched off of the larger formation. This was the first time scientists observed the process of a dark spot being disrupted, making the discovery an exciting one. These storms are high-pressure systems that rotate clockwise. Measuring 4,600 miles across, the current storm is larger than the Atlantic Ocean and the fourth darkest spot that the Hubble has detected since 1993. It did not travel toward Neptune's equator, as these storms usually do before they break up. The smaller storm that scientists believe broke off measures 3,900 miles across. It was really exciting to see this one act how it was supposed to act, and then all of a sudden it just stops and swings back," Michael H. Wong of the University of California at Berkeley said in a NASA statement. While Neptune's storms are largely a mystery, the ongoing one is the most closely studied so far, and scientists are gleaning more information than ever before about these strange weather systems. Life Beneath the Ice Earlier this year, scientists from the British Antarctic Survey announced the discovery of a tiny, mysterious life form a half mile beneath the ice of the Filchner Ron ice shelf on the southeastern Weddell Sea. In such an inhospitable environment, where pressure increases and temperature drops the further down you go, researchers naturally expected the presence of life to diminish. The survey team drilled nearly 3,000 feet into the ice and found what they believe may be an entirely new species clinging to a rock in the complete darkness. 162 miles from the open ocean. Although past studies have found various life forms this far beneath the ice, including fish, worms, jellyfish, and krill, this is the first time researchers have discovered filter feeding organisms at that depth. It appears to go against all previous theories of what types of life could survive, the researcher said in a press release. Biogeographer and lead study author Dr. Hu Griffiths expressed his surprise, stating, Our discovery raises so many more questions than it answers, such as how did they get there? What are they eating? How long have they been there? Are these the same species as we see outside the ice shelf, or are they new species? And what would happen to these communities if the ice shelf collapsed? Scientists have only explored a tennis court-sized portion of the ice shelves in the Southern Ocean, which occupy a total of nearly 580,000 square miles. All things considered, there may be even more fascinating discoveries waiting to be made. Yellow Penguin While snapping pictures on a remote island in the South Georgia Islands in the Southern Atlantic Ocean, Belgian photographer Yves Adams captured a photo of an extremely rare yellow king penguin. I'd never seen or heard of a yellow penguin before, he told Kennedy News and Media, adding there were about 120,000 birds on the beach, and this was the only yellow one there. Like their relative, the emperor penguin, king penguins typically bear the black and white tuxedo look with a dab of yellow on their collar. 
Oddly, the yellow penguin retained this pigment, but appears to have lost its darker feathers. According to the Australian Antarctic Program, unusual plumage is rare among penguins, and it's difficult for scientists to determine the causes of these anomalies. In many cases, genetic mutations are responsible, although other factors such as disease, diet, or injury can play a role. Adams stated that the yellow penguin has leucism, a genetic condition marked by the loss of some, but not all, of an animal's melanin. Conservation biologist D. Boresma agreed with this assessment. Unlike true albinos, leucistic creatures have not completely lost all their pigment. But not all experts feel this way. Behavioral ecologist Kevin McGraw, who did not participate in the expedition, said that he doesn't believe the penguin is leucistic, because it appears to have lost all its melanin, even if it does not have the same white hue as a typical albino. Eh, potato, potato. But he conceded, scientists would need to gather plumage samples from the animal and test them to know for sure. One thing all the experts seem to agree on is that they've never seen a penguin quite like it, and they can't tell just by looking at the bird what causes its unusual coloration. Giant Footprint of Ping Yan In late 2016, photographs of a giant human-shaped footprint that a group of photographers supposedly discovered in the province of Gizhou in southwestern China circulated on social media. Numerous websites reportedly claimed that the footprint was real, despite its unrealistically gargantuan proportions, measuring 22.4 inches long, 7.9 inches wide, and 1.2 inches deep. The measurements might vary, but it's multiple times larger than the average human male's foot, which measures about 10 inches long. It was reportedly found fossilized in rock and dated back to 200 million years ago, long before humans or our ancestors walked the Earth. It has come to be known as the Ping Yan footprint, and is propagating the many myths and stories about giants that once roamed the Earth. Almost all ancient cultures tell tales of giants, but they are mostly just that, stories. However, this footprint is questionable. Is it real or man-made? A footprint found in Bolivia turned out to be from a large carnivorous dinosaur rather than that of a giant. Other footprints found in Africa also have questionable origins. The fact-checking site Snopes failed to turn up any articles in the local Gizu newspapers or any other reliable sources from the time the footprint was discovered. Moreover, its provenance was never proven. Many have denounced Michael Tellinger, the so-called archaeologist who supposedly discovered the Ping Yan footprint, as a conspiracy theorist, so many do not take him seriously. As of now, it remains unexplained. Planet Nine In recent years, scientists began to wonder if there is possibly a ninth unknown planet in our solar system, yet they haven't been able to find it. Believe it or not, experts' understanding of the outer solar system is relatively new, having made most discoveries beyond Neptune after 1992. But they have found thousands of space objects since then, making it hard to understand why, if there is a ninth planet orbiting the Sun much further away than Neptune and Uranus, nobody has spotted it yet. Researchers formed the theory of a Planet 9 in 2015 based solely on mathematical calculations, speculating that the Neptune-sized planet travels a highly elongated orbit. If scientists' numbers are correct, this mysterious planet may have 10 times more mass than the Sun and may travel 20 times further from the Sun than Neptune. For now, experts are working diligently to figure out a way to determine for sure if there is a ninth planet. Last year, a team of scientists from Harvard University theorized that by studying black holes in the outer solar system, they will be able to determine whether there is a distant planet orbiting the Sun or if the unknown object is actually a black hole. They will rely on data gleaned from Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time, a 10-year survey of the sky slated to launch in 2022, meaning any definitive answers will probably not come anytime soon. COVID-19 in Africa as the ongoing global coronavirus pandemic grips the planet, having infected over 26 million people worldwide so far, scientists were surprised when the African continent was not the most heavily affected as they had expected. Out of nearly 631,000 total COVID-19 cases in South Africa as of last September, 15,000 people had died from the disease. While Africa certainly is not exempt from the deadly virus, its caseload has remained relatively low, despite the prediction that the coronavirus would spread more easily in heavily impoverished areas. After all, this was certainly the case in Brazil and India, where COVID-19 spread like wildfire once it hit densely populated poor neighborhoods. Yet the countries of Africa fared much better when it came to both caseloads and death rates. So why? There are likely numerous factors at play, but scientists do not know for sure. 
Salim Abdul Karim, head of South Africa's COVID-19 response team, told the BBC that most African countries don't have a peak. I don't understand why. I'm completely at sea. One possibility is that Africa's population, which is much younger on average than the populations in the hardest hit countries, was better able to resist and overcome the virus. Another theory suggests that exposure to other human coronaviruses that cause common colds may have elicited an immune response in some people. I can't think of anything else that would explain the numbers of completely asymptomatic people we're seeing. The numbers are completely unbelievable, Professor Shabir Mahdi told the BBC. Public cooperation with safety measures and quick government responses to the virus may also play a role in Africa's lower case numbers. But as these statistics show, COVID-19 is a very real problem in Africa, even if scientists are seeing fewer cases of it and a better immune response. Kardim warned that it is still possible for the virus to mutate and spread like crazy throughout the continent. Evasive Black Hole Scientists believe that a supermassive black hole sits at the center of every galaxy. A black hole in the Milky Way has the mass of 4 million suns, for example, and M87's black hole measures 2.4 billion solar masses. Based on the mass of the galaxy at the center of the Abel 2261 cluster, researchers expected it to have a central black hole weighing as much as 3 to 10 billion suns. Yet they've never detected it, despite searching numerous times. Between 1999 and 2004, researchers used data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory to look for X-rays streaming from the middle of the galaxy. The presence of X-rays is a good indicator of the possible presence of a black hole. As materials fall into the void, they accelerate and heat up, spewing intense X-ray light. The team found nothing. A more thorough recent study also proved fruitless, even after searching not just in the galaxy's center, but elsewhere. Scientists acted on the theory that two supermassive black holes may have collided and formed a recoiling black hole, and that the gravitational waves were asymmetrical, sending the object off course. But researchers have never seen one of these objects. They exist purely in theory, and they did not find one when they searched the Abel 2261 cluster but are hoping to glean some answers following the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope this October. Neanderthal Speech One big question scientists have is how did people sound in the past? And how did we develop speech? Scientists do not all agree on how our cousins, the Neanderthals, communicated with one another, or whether they were capable of verbal speech. There is only one preserved Neanderthal hyoid bone, which for humans helps us swallow, speak, and take in air. But with only one of these bones available for examination, it's difficult for scientists to determine whether speech was even possible for Neanderthals. One group of experts used computer modeling to reconstruct a Neanderthal's skull, including where they think the hyoid bone sat. They also reconstructed what the hominid's voice box looked like and determined that Neanderthals were probably able to use their mouths, tongues, and throats similarly to how modern humans do. Because Neanderthals had differently shaped skulls than we do, their noises would have sounded different from ours. Writing for Gizmodo, researcher and anthropologist Anna Goldfield speculated that the Neanderthals' vowels, especially, would probably sound peculiar to us. She further explained that while it sounds possible for Neanderthals to communicate, evidence more strongly suggests that they did not. On the other hand, Stephen C. Levinson, director emeritus of the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, wrote that it's unlikely that Neanderthals performed a variety of other tasks we know they were capable of, including using symbolic media and advanced technology, without being capable of speech. He said they possessed the right genes and anatomy for being able to communicate verbally. What do you think? Did language emerge among us, modern humans, as an exclusive trait that no other species possessed? Or is it possible that our distant cousins, the Neanderthals, were also capable of developing speech? As of now, we are still waiting for an explanation. Pirate Shipwreck English pirate Captain Sam Bellamy, better known as Black Sam, was reportedly the wealthiest pirate in recorded history. He operated during the early 18th century, capturing as many as 54 ships in just a little over a year with the help of his crew. His ship, the Waida, was carrying the cargo and valuables of all of these ships, and it is unknown how much treasure was actually on board. Nicknamed the Prince of Pirates, Black Sam had a reputation for being unusually merciful and even generous to his captives. Additionally, he was known for his racially diverse crew, which included African-American and formerly enslaved members. In an interview with As It Happens host Carol Off, underwater archaeologist Barry Clifford explained that everyone had the opportunity to vote and was entitled to a share of any treasure seized. 
Black Sam was more or less a real-life Robin Hood of the seas, with an admirable sense of justice and equality, along with a disdain for corruption and those who stole from the poor. The Wida was wrecked in a storm in 1717, and the man's body was never recovered, until now. In 1982, archaeologists discovered the treasure-laden Wida off the Cape Cod coast. Now they believe they have found the skeletons of six pirates, perhaps including Black Sam himself. Archaeologists are now more excited about studying the bones than the treasure. The bones are encased inside hardened masses called concretions full of other objects like spoons, bronze weapons, and other bits and pieces. Experts plan to try removing them for further analysis, including DNA testing, in a mission to match the genetic information to a living descendant of Bellamy's, whom they obtained a DNA sample from in 2018. If we found Bellamy, we would return him to his local graveyard, said Clifford, adding his town would be extremely excited about that. Out of 140 pirates who died aboard the Wida, 102 washed ashore. Clifford, who led the dive that originally discovered the wreck, believes dozens of men may have been aboard the ship when it flipped and sank. The pirate himself has now become the treasure. Vindolanda Collection Vindolanda was a Roman auxiliary fort near Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland. Located at the edge of the Roman Empire, it guarded the Stain Gate, a major highway that led to Caledonia. The timber and stone forts at Vindolanda were rebuilt at least nine times, creating one of the most complex archaeological sites in Britain. Vindolanda is full of archaeological artifacts and is famous for having the largest Roman leather shoe and boot collection ever discovered in the UK. In addition to footwear, archaeologists have unearthed over 7,000 objects, including large numbers of tent panels, decorative embellishments, horse gear, leather scraps, and more. While searching through a collection of hundreds of scraps during lockdown in 2020, researchers found one that was cut into the shape of a mouse. Measuring 4.8 inches by 1 inch long, the cutout creature has knife slits marking its eyes and fur. It dates back to sometime between 105 and 130 AD and was likely either a child's toy or perhaps even used for a practical joke. One of the most wonderful things about the Vindolanda collection is that we never know what we are going to find next, said Vindolanda Trust curator Barbara Bailey when explaining the site's immense archaeological value. The Vindolanda tablets are, quite arguably, the site's most remarkable discovery. Found preserved near the floors of the buried wooden forts, they are Britain's oldest known surviving handwritten documents. They provide a rare glimpse into the daily goings-on at Vindolanda 2,000 years ago, including the private and military lives of its residents. Several of the tablets, which discuss everyday matters like birthday cards and underwear, are on display at the Roman Vindolanda Fort and Museum, located at the original site. Pompeii's Treasures Earlier this year, the Antiquarium Museum reopened for the first time in over 40 years. Housing some of Pompeii's best-preserved artifacts, including protective amulets and plaster casts of victims of the infamous eruption, the Antiquarium is an introduction to the site, told through the most significant artifacts of the ancient city, from the Samnite era to the tragic eruption of 79 AD. Here, visitors can see all kinds of things, including frescoes, graffiti, and bronze and marble statues, and everyday objects such as tableware and a bronze food warmer. You can step right into the past. Speaking to the Associated Press, Pompeii Archaeological Park Director Massimo Osana said, I find particularly touching the last room, the one dedicated to the eruption, and where on display are the objects deformed by the heat of the eruption, the casts of the victims, and the casts of the animals. The Antiquarium first opened in 1873, but was partially destroyed by bombs and lost several of its artifacts during World War II. Five years later, in 1948, the museum reopened, but it was once again closed following the 1980 Irpinia earthquake. Exhibits began reopening in 2016, but the museum was finally fully reopened in January. Here, tourists can finally see some of the significant artifacts that sat in secured storage facilities for years and which constitute some of the site's most important artifacts. Mary Queen of Scots Pomander Mary Queen of Scots is perhaps best known for being beheaded for plotting to kill Queen Elizabeth I. Born into royalty, Mary inherited the Scottish throne at just six days old in 1542 upon her father's death. Her entire life was marked by controversy and suspicious ties to violence. She was married twice, in 1558 and 1565, and each husband died within a year or two after marrying. 
Mary's second husband, her English cousin Lord Darnley, was killed in an explosion, and her lover, the Earl of Bothwell, was the suspected culprit. Bothwell was acquitted, and Mary went on to marry him that same year. The nobility was outraged, and Mary tried, but failed, to bring an army against them with the goal of murdering Queen Elizabeth I to take her rightful place as the Catholic Queen. She was subsequently imprisoned and was executed 19 years later in 1586. This silver pomander or perfume container reportedly belonged to Mary, Queen of Scots. Measuring just 1.6 inches by 1 inch, the vessel is attached to a chain and consists of a spherical silver body and eight segments bearing intricate motifs. The eight parts have hinges that open to reveal a container with an attached chain. Inside would be ambergris, a waxy substance produced by sperm whales mixed with flowers and spices believed to protect the wearer from infections and bad smells. The artifact is now property of the Royal Collection Trust. Isle of Man Viking Artifacts While treasure hunting on the Isle of Man, a self-governing British dependency between the UK and Ireland, retired police officer and amateur metal detectorist Kath Giles discovered a collection of Viking artifacts dating back over 1,000 years. The fascinating find was declared national treasure and included a gold arm ring, a large silver brooch, a silver armband, and many more items. Giles discovered the items, which are thought to have been buried around 950 AD on private land last year. She knew straight away that she had found something significant. She gave an interview to The Guardian and said, I'm so thrilled to have found artifacts that are not only so important, but so beautiful. In accordance with the 2017 Isle of Man Treasure Act, Giles contacted the Manx National Heritage Museum to report the find. Alison Fox, the museum's curator for archaeology, was pretty excited and said that the arm ring is a rare find. She says that gold items were not very common during the Viking Age. Silver was by far the more common metal for trading and displaying wealth. It has been estimated that gold was worth 10 times the value of silver and that this arm ring could have been the equivalent of 900 silver coins. At the time the artifacts were buried, the Isle of Man was an important economic and trading area. Now it's famous for motorcycle races and the Manx cat, the one that has no tail. Experts are working on determining the discovery's value, and Giles will receive a share as a reward. Anglo-Saxon Cemetery and Treasure While conducting routine excavations ahead of the construction of a new housing development in Northamptonshire, England, Archaeologists from the Museum of London Archaeology recently discovered a large Anglo-Saxon burial site dating back roughly 1,500 years. It contains 154 graves filled with around 3,000 items, ranging from weapons to jewelry. There was treasure and graves everywhere. It's the biggest Anglo-Saxon cemetery ever found in Northamptonshire, according to a statement from project manager and archaeologist Simon Marcus. In his words, it is rare to find both an Anglo-Saxon settlement and a cemetery in a single excavation. The burial site is located near a settlement containing 42 structures, also around 1,500 years old. Life Science reported that the grave goods consist of around 150 brooches, 15 rings, 2,000 beads, 25 spears, 40 knives, and 15 shields. Perhaps most important was the discovery of cloth textiles, which actually almost never survived time but in this case, the metal objects nearby had caused them to mineralize. Nearby, researchers also found a 4,000-year-old Bronze Age cemetery containing 46 prehistoric burials, three burial mounds, and four buildings. Marcus explained that the discoveries will teach researchers about the everyday lives of both Anglo-Saxon people and Bronze Age residents, including their diets and health, as well as these ancient society's origins. Ancient Roman Shipwreck Earlier this year, archaeologists announced the discovery of a rare Roman shipwreck off the Greek island of Kassos. Situated along a major ancient maritime trade route between Crete and Karpathos, Kassos is the southernmost Greek island in the Aegean Sea and was once home to Minoan and Mycenaean cultures. Dating back to sometime between 200 and 300 AD, the newly discovered Roman vessel is loaded with ceramic amphorae that were produced in modern-day Tunisia and Spain, and which were likely once filled with oil, according to a statement from the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports. The discovery was made as part of the ongoing Casos Maritime Archaeological Project, which has spent the last three years focusing on finding, recording, and studying submerged artifacts around Casos. A team of 23 scientists and technicians conducted over 100 dives in the enormous investigation of the vessel, logging over 200 hours of diving time. 
In addition to the Roman ship, the team identified three other ancient shipwrecks, including one laden with Hellenistic-era amphorae, dating back to roughly the 1st century BC. Another, even older shipwreck dated back to the 5th century BC, while the third capsized vessel is from modern times. This place was kind of dangerous. Hoxney Horde Back in 1992, retiree and metal detectorist Eric Laws went treasure hunting in Hoxney Village, Suffolk, England. He was searching for a lost hammer, but quickly discovered what came to be known as the largest ever cache of Roman treasure ever found in Britain. Known as the Hoxney Hoard, it contained at least 60 pounds of gold and silver objects, which archaeologists removed from the site by the shovelful. The artifacts included over 15,000 Roman coins, 200 gold objects, and dozens of silver spoons, according to Smithsonian Magazine. Laws and the landowner received generous seven-figure payouts for the find. Meanwhile, experts gleaned invaluable insight during the island's turbulent separation from the Roman Empire around 410 AD. During the late 4th century, British Roman subjects lost the empire's protection, leading to a period of mass hoarding among citizens in an effort to protect their belongings from raiding forces. In trying to answer questions about exactly what prompted wealthy Romano-British families to bury their treasures in such high quantities, experts referenced the age of the Hoxney Hoard's coins. They initially determined that the cache was buried sometime in 408 or 409 AD, but later findings suggest that the coins continued to circulate for decades after the Roman Empire withdrew its influence from the region. Nearly all the Hoxney Hoard coins are clipped by up to one-third, with the excess material likely being used to make imitation coins. This indicates that the Roman Emperor was no longer supplying Britain with new coins, according to Roman archaeologist Peter Guest, who spoke with Smithsonian Magazine. Another expert, archaeologist Catherine Johns, alleges that the family who owned the Hoxney Hoard attached sentimental value to its items and even used them before carefully burying them, indicating that the items were not hidden under duress like they would be during a time of turmoil. Regardless of when the Hoxney Hoard was buried, which remains disputed to this day, there is one thing researchers can agree on. It's one of the most valuable and telling Roman-era treasure collections ever found in the world. Cave of the Jaguar God in 2018, archaeologists from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History accidentally discovered a sealed cave full of treasure amid a maze of dark tunnels on the Yucatan Peninsula. The hoard was found in Balamku, or the Jaguar God, a series of seven sacred chambers beneath the ruins of Chichen Itza, a Maya city that thrived between the 9th and 13th centuries AD, during which time it reached a peak population of millions. Within the cave, the team identified over 150 artifacts, including vases, incense burners, and decorative plates bearing the faces of gods and religious icons. According to an official statement released by Inna, archaeologists believe that the objects were untouched for over 1,000 years prior to the discovery. Well, for the most part. In 1966, archaeologist Victor Segovia Pinto recorded but did not excavate its contents. He then commissioned local farmers to seal the cavern's entrance for reasons that are unknown to this day, and his records conveniently went missing. Until recent decades, archaeologists were primarily interested in monumental archaeology rather than cave archaeology. Although the significance of such sites long went unrecognized, modern researchers are lucky to have the opportunity to examine the recently discovered objects in their undisturbed state. Through these artifacts, they hope to learn more about the mysterious Maya collapse, which some scholars believe was triggered by a series of catastrophic droughts. Anglo-Saxon Find of the Century In what's being hailed as one of the most exciting finds of Anglo-Saxon archaeology since the 19th century, an early medieval cemetery containing over 60 graves was recently discovered beneath student housing at Cambridge University. The burials were found earlier this year amid the demolition of several 1930s-era buildings, with plans to build more modern amenities. Archaeologists uncovered hundreds of items in the graves dating back to the early Anglo-Saxon period between 400 and 650 AD, including bead necklaces, bronze brooches, swords, short blades, pottery, glass flasks, and more, according to The Guardian. Additionally, the team found evidence of Iron Age and Roman structures. The site's human remains were well-preserved because of the alkaline soil that helped to prevent them from decomposing, according to Dr. Caroline Goodson, an early medieval history professor at King's College. Archaeologists will likely be able to examine the bones using modern technology, hopefully gleaning DNA and more information about the dead's lives. By examining genetic information, researchers can learn about their family relationships and migration history. 
These findings fly in the face of Bede's ecclesiastical history, an 8th century text claiming that Cambridge was abandoned during the 5th century. What instead happened, according to Goodson, is that the area was mostly abandoned, with post-Roman settlements emerging thereafter, populated by both earlier Roman residents and recently arrived migrants. And she said they lived, ate, dressed, and utilized the land differently than the Romans did. The people at that time seemed to have been buried with objects the Romans left behind, meaning they must have had some sort of emotional connection with them. Skull Helmets While excavating some 2,100-year-old burial mounds at a site in Salango, Ecuador, between 2014 and 2016, archaeologists unearthed the skeletons of two infants who were laid to rest wearing helmets made from the skulls of older children. The ancient ritual complex where they were buried belonged to the Guangala culture, and the children died around 100 BC. One died at around 18 months old and wore the skull of a child who passed away when they were between 4 and 12 years old. The other infant died between 6 and 9 months old and wore the skull of a child between 2 and 12 years old. Perhaps most disturbingly, archaeologists said that the older kids' skulls likely still had flesh on them when they were affixed to the infant's skulls, as the bare bones of such young people likely would not hold together on their own. A study detailing the findings describes the infant's burials as the only known case of anyone ever using juvenile crania as mortuary headgear. Many unanswered questions surround the skull helmets, but for now, researchers theorize that the helmets may have been meant to protect the baby's souls. They hope to get closer to the bottom of the issue by performing DNA and isotope analysis on the bones. The children were excavated along with nine other individuals, several who were buried with figurines, shells, and various other small objects. Tomb Full of Soup Bowls In late 2017, news broke of the discovery of a 3,100-year-old tomb in Baoji City in China's Shangqi province. Called Tomb M4, Inside were various bronze soup bowls and other food vessels covered in intricate designs, as well as an unidentified person's badly decomposed remains. One of the most unique artifacts is a four-handled soup bowl covered in 192 spikes and decorated with dragons, birds, and bovines. Researchers also found two deer-shaped wine vessels. All these items were considered ritualistic, meaning that they would have been used in religious ceremonies or funerals. The team of archaeologists who found the tomb published their findings, guessing that the occupant of Tomb M4 was most likely of elite status and could potentially be a high-ranking chief or the spouse of a chief. The researchers explained that the vessels in M4 may have been war spoils honoring the deceased individual. It's believed that the person buried in the tomb was from the Zhao dynasty. When they died, the Zhao were battling the Shang and would eventually emerge victorious. Some of the tomb's vessels contain inscriptions indicating that they may have been stolen from the Shang and put into the grave. Throughout the excavations, at least 56 other tombs were discovered nearby. This is all thanks to construction workers who were building houses in the area and came upon some bronze vessels. As you know, some of the most amazing discoveries happen by accident. Burnt City Burials over the past 40 years or so, archaeologists have unearthed more than 1,200 burials at the ancient site of Shar-e Sokhta, or the Burnt City in Iran. A few specific burials dating back 2,800 years ago stand out among the rest. One was a grave in the shape of a circle with the skeletal remains of an adult man along with two dog skulls situated above his head and 12 human skulls on the other side of the grave. Another burial held the bones of a 25- to 30-year-old man whose head was placed at his lower right side with two daggers. The tools may have been used to behead the man who was perhaps executed for committing some sort of offense, according to project director Sayed Mansour Sajadi. These graves appear to be unique, with no others like them being found so far. They raise numerous questions, including why these people were buried the way that they were, and why are they so close together? With skulls of some mixed with remains from others? Whatever it is, archaeologists have no idea. The Burnt City dates back some 5,200 years. It's one of the most significant Bronze Age sites in Iran and the Middle East, having once served as a major trade center of the ancient world. Thousands of artifacts have been found there, with these bizarre burials constituting some of the strangest finds so far. Fossilized Beasts between 11 and 12 million years ago, the Texas coastal plain was filled with huge, exotic animals unlike anything seen in North America today, including rhinos, antelopes with horns like a slingshot, and even camels. 
a genus of elephant-like beasts called gomphotheres with tusks, trunks, and shovel-like jaws also roamed the region. Thousands of fossils of these Miocene creatures were unearthed during the Great Depression era between 1939 and 1941, when the U.S. government put men to work excavating and building all over the place. In addition to these animals, these bone hunters also found the oldest American alligator fossils on record and remains of an extinct dog relative. Scientists began studying the fossils in depth in recent years, bringing them out of storage finally, and have learned that the region once resembled the modern-day Serengeti ecosystem in Africa. A 2019 study examined bones found at four sites near what is now Beeville, Texas. As part of their work, researchers returned to some of the sites and retrieved even more fossils that previous workers overlooked while searching for bigger and more obvious bones. There are also 86 fossils encased in plaster that were found in the original excavations and which have yet to be studied. The team hopes to conduct isotope analysis on them to determine the animals' diets and glean other details about how they lived. Unusual figurine Archaeologists have found a one-of-a-kind figurine wearing a feather headdress at a prehistoric burial site in Novosibirsk, Russia. Discovered among several other artifacts, the statue was made of an unidentified material. It appears to wear a feathered headpiece, which is not typical of artifacts found in Siberia, and researchers are kind of confused. Is it feathers, or is it a halo? For now, they are trying to determine the origins and story behind the figurine. The team also found a bird figurine made from bone, which was likely a pendant or sewn onto clothing, according to excavation leader Dr. Natalia Basova, who spoke with the Siberian Times. The figurines have holes in them to either wear as a necklace or sewn onto your clothes because back then it was kind of the only way to take small and valuable things with you. She described additional finds including four anthropomorphic figurines made from mammoth tusk, sandstone, birch burl, and an unknown organic material. They are also trying to figure out what the material is. The experts also found a moose figurine made from shale, which was likely used for ritualistic purposes. In male burials, they unearthed belt buckles made from bone and small sculptures. The site dates back at least as far back as the 3rd millennium BC, but it may be even older, with some artifacts perhaps dating to the 4th millennium BC. Untangling the site's past is proving to be a complex task due to a tsunami that washed over the soil around 4,000 years ago and a modern potato farm that further disturbed the grounds. Archaeologists think that it's possible the figurines come from the Krotovo culture, but the quality and beauty of the figurines are worthy of being in a museum for everyone to enjoy. Stone Sculpture While plowing his field in 2019, a Newton Grove, North Carolina resident named Tom Giddens discovered a bizarre stone sculpture bearing a face that has experts stumped. Archaeologist Mary Beth Fitz described the object to CBS 17, stating, It really is mysterious. We don't know what time period it's from. It could be a piece of folk art, or it could have been made a long time ago. It's made of sandstone, and that's a pretty soft stone, so you don't need special tools to carve sandstone, so that means it really could have been carved any time in history. Giddon decided to keep the artifact, but while she was examining it, Fitz took the opportunity to create a 3D model of the sculpture. She hopes to learn more about the object through a member of the public who recognizes it, or from someone who ends up discovering a similar artifact. So keep your eyes open for any information and be sure to share if you know anything. Tattooed Ice Maiden Nicknamed the Siberian Ice Maiden, a 2,500-year-old mummy tells the story of a woman who died in her 20s during the 5th century BC. She was discovered in 1993 on an icy plateau in eastern Russia's Altai Mountains, where she has been laid to rest beneath another grave. The burial above her was looted at some point, but thankfully the Ice Maiden went unnoticed until archaeologists found her. Hailing from the Pazirix culture, the Ice Maiden stood at five and a half feet tall, which was taller than the average person of her time. She was found laying on her side inside a wooden coffin, wearing white stockings, a white skirt with maroon stripes, and a yellow Chinese silk blouse. In an interview with The Independent, Dr. Natalia Polosmak from the Russian Academy of Sciences explained that the blouse had been repaired several times, as silk was a rare and prized commodity. The woman's burial was surrounded by six horses, indicating that she was an elite member of her society. She was so well preserved, her tattoos of deer and snow leopards were still visible. Water had seeped into her tomb and frozen her into a block of ice, keeping her in remarkably good shape over the many centuries since her death. Archaeologists poured hot water over the woman to melt the ice, and in the process, her skin darkened. Experts spent years working to restore her as close to the state she was found in as possible, 
and to learn more about her life and death. They are still not entirely sure why she died, but they discovered signs that the woman experienced a sudden illness before her death. MRI scans showed that she most likely suffered from breast cancer. She also had a bone infection and bore injuries indicating she had fallen. This could possibly explain a container of material found in the Ice Maiden's grave, which scientists believe could have been marijuana that she used for relief from her ailments. Biblical Rock Etchings In a southwestern corner of Israel's Negev Desert on Mount Karkom near Egypt's Sinai Peninsula is a barren plateau filled with petroglyphs and ancient stone tools. Sitting 2,780 feet above sea level, the plateau's history of human habitation may date as far back as 400,000 years. Today, the environment is harsh and unforgiving, but back then it was lusher, greener, and more hospitable overall. It served as a good vantage point for scoping out animals to hunt in the forest below, an activity that was still going on as recently as 17,000 years ago. Professor Emmanuel Anati, who spoke with the Israel Times, discovered these artifacts in 1954, before returning there numerous times starting in 1980 to conduct additional excavations with colleagues. Altogether, he identified 300 Paleolithic, or early Stone Age sites on the mountain containing as many as 40,000 rock engravings dating as far back as 7,000 years. Anati also identified at least 100 geoglyphs, which are so large they are only recognizable from an aerial point of view. The rock engravings depict animals, humans, footprints, and various scenes, including images of people with their arms raised in prayer, and scenes that strike researchers as having biblical overtones. Some even believe that Mount Karkom is the location the Bible's writers were thinking about when they talked of Mount Sinai, but this suspicion remains unproven. Over half the rock images are of ibexes, demonstrating the animal's significance to the culture that created the artwork. Experts speculate that it may have symbolized a resurrected god, a life and death cycle, or fertility of the soil, but they don't know for sure. Chiquihuite Cave Researchers seeking to learn what the ancient climate was like in the high desert mountains of north-central Mexico instead discovered what they believe is evidence of early human occupation, with the potential to drastically alter the historical narrative of the Americas. At the site, known as Chiquihuite Cave, the team found thousands of ancient artifacts, including projectile points, that are believed to date as far back as 30,000 years. Because the objects are made from a type of limestone that does not occur naturally in the cave, Researchers believe it was transported there by humans. If proven to be true, the collection would represent the oldest known evidence of a human presence in the Americas. Oddly, however, no human or animal remains were found at the site. Human DNA was detected, but the team admittedly was unsure whether it was left by ancient humans or if someone working there had accidentally contaminated the scene. Today, Chiquihuite Cave is situated in an environment too hostile for anyone to reasonably believe humans could or would want to live there. But at the time the alleged stone tools were created, the area was much greener. When the first inhabitants of the Americas arrived has long been a source of contention among experts, with the most favored theory holding that people first came around 13,500 years ago. As more discoveries are made, that date keeps getting pushed further back with the Chiquihuite Cave pushing the debate to its limit thus far. Some scientists reject the newly proposed idea that humans may have arrived in the Americas 30,000 years ago, because it predates the existence of the Bering Land Bridge that many researchers believe people used to get there in the first place. One thing remains certain, it will take quite some time for experts to fully disentangle the mysteries behind who got to the Americas first, and they may not ever find the answer. Muscular Woman Nearly 6,000 years ago, a mysterious woman lived and died in what is now Nicaragua. A team of archaeologists found her remains near the country's Caribbean coastline just a few years ago. This was a rare surprise, as human remains typically do not remain intact in the tropical region. Because she was buried in a shell mound, which reduced the soil's acidity, the woman was better preserved than usual. The researchers discovered the remains in a place called the Angie site, which was originally excavated in the 1970s. Apparently, the original team had missed the woman, who was buried seven and a half feet below the ground surface. She was laid to rest in a shallow oval pit, with her knees drawn toward her stomach and her arms at her sides. The woman died between 25 and 40 years old. She was petite, standing at just under five feet tall. Not only are these the oldest human remains found in Lower Central America, something about the lady stood out to scientists. Her forearms were extremely muscular, despite her small stature. 
This may have been from rowing or some other physical activity, according to study leader Mirjana Roxandich. Rowing is common in the area to this day, where people often travel by boat. The woman's teeth show wear and tear from eating shellfish, which is also still common among modern locals. Little is known about Lower Central America's indigenous cultures, given the scarcity of human remains there. More research is necessary to determine her identity or anything significant about her life or burial. The New Jersey Sea Monster Doug Cutler, a fisherman from New Jersey, made headlines in 2013 for spearing a seemingly prehistoric, vicious-looking, eel-like creature in the Raritan River. Its suction-like mouth was filled with rows of terrifying teeth, making it look more like something straight out of a science fiction film than a real animal. In an interview with NJ.com, Cutler recalled that the catch measured roughly three feet long and weighed four and a half pounds. He had captured the creature in 2011 and posted pictures on his Facebook page, but the images didn't go viral until two years later, when his friend posted them in a contest of weird catches on Reddit. The photos captured the internet's attention, garnering millions of views. The strange appearance of the creature prompted some people to speculate that the photos were photoshopped, but this was far from true. In fact, the specimen in question is an actual parasitic species called a sea lamprey, and according to Cutler, seeing one is nothing new in the river. He had seen them in the local waters where he grew up his entire life and decided to spear one that spring day in 2011 simply because he never had before, and the opportunity presented itself. Cutler said that catching the sea lamprey was fairly simple, but he didn't plan on eating it, although some fishermen do, so he placed it back in the water and let it go. Sea lampreys, which typically dwell in salt water but venture upstream in rivers to reproduce, are considered to have a natural presence in New Jersey but they are labeled an invasive species in several parts of the U.S., particularly the Great Lakes region, where they outcompete native species and threaten the local ecosystem. Fish within a fish After fishing for eight hours with no bites at the Guadalupe River near San Antonio, Texas earlier this year, Stephanie Drew and Nathan Beloff decided to change course and head down to Cibolo Creek in hopes of having better luck there. From their canoe, the couple spotted a largemouth bass acting strangely in the water. We thought it might have been caught on an old line or something, Drew told LMT Online. We saw something in its mouth, but didn't know what it was. It took the couple several tries to catch the fish, but eventually Stephanie was able to grab it and saw right away why it had been behaving so bizarrely. There was a live perch stuck in the bass's mouth. Using pliers, the pair removed the perch and returned both fish to the water. This particular bass had some eyes bigger than his belly, Stephanie joked, adding, but we got the perch out and they both got to swim another day. It was a once-in-a-lifetime moment, for sure. Long-nosed Chimera Carrie Goodyear, a Canadian fisherman from the town of Templeman in Newfoundland and Labrador, encountered this strange surprise last August while fishing for turbot in the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. While hauling in their nets from over 800 meters deep, Goodyear and his crew noticed the most bizarre-looking fish any of them had ever seen. Nobody knew what species the one-meter-long creature was. I thought it was a platypus because he had a big snout on it, the fisherman told CBC. It looked like he had wings and his nose was, it was almost like rubber. I guess it was like cartilage. Goodyear took to social media for help identifying the fish and soon learned that it was from the long-nosed chimera family of deep-dwelling cartilaginous fish. The ancient creatures, who are related to sharks, are known to swim as far as 2,000 meters below the water's surface. We didn't know it had a spine with venom in it, Goodyear said. It was just another fish to us, and we were handling that with bare hands. Because of their deep water habitat, it's unusual for someone to spot a long-nosed chimera. Consequently, scientists don't know much about them. Carolyn Meary, a marine biologist with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, told CBC that the specimen Goodyear caught probably died on its way up to the surface due to changes in water pressure. She explained that the fishermen were lucky for this because they would have been more likely to suffer from a sting if the creature had still been alive, adding, but even with a dead animal, people need to be super careful because of that long spine. It's very sharp. Have you ever caught a fish or a creature that you had no idea what it was? If you have, let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Alligator Gars Some commercial fishermen captured two strange prehistoric looking fish while carp fishing in the Yakima River Delta near Bateman Island in Washington State last year. The fish had strange teeth unlike anything they had seen before. Both measured between two and three feet long. Based on their appearance, the fish were clearly not native to the waters of the Pacific Northwest. The fishermen returned the creatures to the water and sent footage of them to Paul Hoffarth, a biologist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
He identified them as alligator gars. The species, which reaches up to 10 feet long, lives in the Mississippi River as far north as Ohio, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Hoffarth told Yak Tri News that someone probably purchased the two alligator gars for their home aquarium, without realizing that they grew so large, and then released them into the river when they no longer fit comfortably in their enclosure. While non-native fish typically don't survive in the region's rivers, invasive species are sometimes very successful, wreaking havoc on an area's ecosystem. Authorities noted that they are monitoring the fish populations in the local waters to ensure that this doesn't happen. Unicorn Fish In mid-2020, a Japanese fisherman named Taku Suganuma caught an alien-looking fish with a protruding head off the Imizu coast. At first glance, he thought the three-foot-long silver creature was a low-sail ribbonfish, which are commonly caught as bycatch during that time of year. Another fisherman suggested that it was a North Pacific crestfish, also called the unicorn fish, a deep-dwelling species that grows up to six and a half feet long. It is found in tropical and subtropical waters of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. When the unicorn fish feels threatened, it releases black ink from its anus. While these fish are known to occasionally end up in fishermen's nets as bycatch, it does not happen often. Suganuma donated the specimen to the Uozu Aquarium so scientists can use it to learn more about the mysterious and seldom seen species, which lives at depths between 656 and 3,280 feet. Unicorn fish generally do not survive for long after being brought to the surface due to differences in water temperature. In 2019, there were eight captured in the Bay of Toyama, and only one lived longer than an hour. It was placed in a large tank where it repeatedly released ink as it swam around in a panicked fashion. Sadly, even though humans rarely come into contact with these fish, our effect on them is far-reaching as plastic pollution found in dead specimen stomachs was clear evidence. A fish with two mouths Plattsburgh, New York resident Debbie Geds was fishing with her husband on Lake Champlain one summer day in 2019 when she caught a fish with two mouths. I had never seen anything like it, she told USA Today. Besides having two mouths, the lake trout seemed to be normal and in good health. Geds snapped some pictures of the freakishly bizarre creature and sent them to a coworker before releasing the fish back into the water. The pictures quickly went viral when Ged's co-worker, Adam Facto, shared the images on a Facebook page belonging to Naughty Boys Fishing, a local competitive fishing group. I've had messages from all over the world, like people asking about this fish, and it seems like everybody's got an opinion on why it has two mouths, Facto told NBC5. Ged believes the fish was possibly injured by another fishing hook. Other popular theories suggest that pollution or a genetic defect could be responsible for the trout's appearance. Ellen Marsden, a professor of fisheries at the University of Vermont, was among a group of experts who examined photos of the fish. She told USA Today that she suspects a random embryonic mutation as the cause, stating it's definitely got two mandibles, two lower jaws. Other scientists from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation agreed. The fish likely had a rare biological anomaly. Skinless Shark In 2019, researchers were beyond perplexed when they caught a live, skinless, toothless, blackmouth cat shark off the Sardinia coast. It was caught at a depth of around 1,640 feet. They couldn't understand how the creature seemed to be alive and well with such an unfortunate condition. This was the first known instance of someone catching a cat shark without the skin-related structures it relies on to defend itself from all types of predators. The team described their fascinating findings in a study in the journal Fish Biology, but they didn't have much information to offer about how the fish became the way it was, or how it managed to survive. They cited genetic abnormalities, warming ocean temperatures, and contamination as all possible reasons for why the cat shark lacked teeth and skin. Getting to the bottom of the confusion could better help conservationists protect marine life, which is increasingly being threatened by the changing climate and other effects of human activities. The Paku Fish In mid-2019, a fisherman named Jimmy Smith captured what he thought was a piranha while fishing in the Catawba River. Experts identified the creature, which had eerily human-like teeth, as a paku fish. The species is native to South America and related to the piranha, but not nearly as aggressive, despite its freakish appearance. Nevertheless, it had no business being in a North Carolina river, but this wasn't the first time a paku appeared far outside its natural habitat. In 2013, for example, New Jersey resident Tom Boylan caught a 10-inch long paku in the town of Passaic, not far from New York City. Earlier that year, someone captured one all the way in Denmark. Pakus are just one of several exotic pet species found in the wild when they become too large for their aquariums and their owners release them. 
this can be severely detrimental to local wildlife. Unfortunately, sightings of exotic fish in waters where they don't belong are on the rise, suggesting that more bizarre catches will come. A mid-meal catch When fisherman Dan Beaudry caught a bass with a snake in its mouth late last year, he felt compelled to share the bizarre incident with the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency on Facebook. Beaudry noticed the snake while inspecting his catch and immediately went for his camera. The head was looking at me right before I took the picture, he told them. I thought it was cool, but wondered how I would explain to an ER doc that I got bit by a snake from putting my fingers in a fish's mouth. Social media users identified the snake as a non-venomous banded water snake, but many agreed that the encounter would terrify them nonetheless. Surprisingly, it turned out that this wasn't the first time something like this happened, with a fisherman commenting that he had a similar experience in the past. Other users shared their strange stories, including one person who recounted finding a turtle inside of a fish's mouth. The TWRA used the incident as an opportunity to remind people to be careful when reaching into a fish's mouth, just in case whatever's in there is alive and dangerous. Bearded Fireworm Texas angler Alyssa Ramirez almost made the mistake of touching a dangerous marine worm she thought was seaweed. She reeled in her fishing line, and luckily, she saw the creature moving in time before she grabbed it. While Ramirez didn't know what it was, she perceived its bright red color as a warning sign that it might be poisonous. The worm had wrapped itself around her bait. Thankfully, it let go, plopped onto the pier, and then wriggled its way back into the water. Out of curiosity, Ramirez contacted Texas Park and Wildlife with a video of the worm. Not touching the worm was a smart move, as the creature in question turned out to be a bearded fireworm. This nocturnal marine bristleworm is capable of injecting a powerful neurotoxin that can cause intense, burning pain for hours. The species typically dwells on the sea floor, hiding under rocks during the day, and is just a few inches long, according to Texas Parks and Wildlife. Even a slight disturbance can cause one to flare out its bristles and administer the painful substance. And as Ramirez's experience shows, it is possible to encounter a bearded fireworm during the day. A Ratfish In 2019, while fishing for blue halibut several miles off the island of Andoya in northern Norway, 19-year-old fishing guide Oscar Lundahl caught a creepy creature with enormous bulbous eyes. It looked like something from another planet, shocking even the experienced angler. Lundahl felt a tug after descending the hooks 2,600 feet below the water's surface. Because his line was so deep, it took the young man about a half hour to reel it in. He could tell that he had caught something big, but he never expected to come face to face with something so alien looking. Several news articles reported that the creature was a ratfish, a deep dwelling shark relative that has existed for an estimated 300 million years and is rarely seen or caught. The Sun, on the other hand, wrote that the fish was a rough head grenadier, also called the onion eye grenadier because of its enormous eyes. While it's unclear what species the fish actually was, there is no question that it's strange enough to mention it here. The creature did not survive its ascent to the surface due to changes in water pressure, so Lundahl prepared and ate it, reporting that despite its ugly appearance, it was really tasty. Would you eat this fish? I don't know if I'm brave enough. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching! If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up for more! See you next time! Bye!